ratio of small pizzas to large pizzas? Two over five. Two over five. That's all simplified. How would you get there? Ninety-six over two over five. Oh, Ninety-six over two forty. So uh, it started out as ninety-six over two forty, and then simplified it came up to common factor. them all up. So we can, we can just compare two groups, make a ratio out of those. We can take uh, one group and compare it to the whole group. We could even compare one group to the sum of these two groups. So it's just a comparison of two different sums. So we're saying for every five large pizzas, there are two small pizzas. Or for every two small pizzas, there's five large pizzas. So first we're going to just Get familiar with the, the lingo and the order of things and all that kind of stuff, writing ratios, um, which I think you're familiar with. That's why I put this problem up to begin with. I'm sure you've heard of ratios before. Uh, and once we work with those, then we'll move on to uh, you know, solving for x. So that's what this is all about, creating an unknown value and then keeping it what it is. Also, I'm going to put a little um, precursor on this. I'm gonna, ask you to solve equations, right, no big surprise, but uh, in a way, I'm going to ask you to solve equations that probably we've solved before, the kind of equations we've solved before. Um, and most likely, though, I'm going to ask you to do it differently than what you've been doing, and you're going to think the way you have been doing it is easier, and the way I'm asking you to do it is more difficult. Um, then I'm going to ask you to please Step out of your comfort zone and try and do it my way. I'm not going to, you know, if you get the right answer on a test, um, as long as you can just guess and check, you can you know, get some kind of math, I'm not going to mark you wrong for any reason. If you get the right answer on these kinds of equations, that's, that's all that matters, really. Well, it's not all that matters, but it's a big deal if you get the right answer. Now, I'm going to ask you to do it my way, to learn to do it my way, because then the equations are just going to get more difficult. I'm going to throw little stuff in there that's going to make um, what you're used to not possible, okay? or at least quite a bit more difficult. So that all sounds really vague, and, and you're not sure what I'm talking about. Um, but I am going to ask you to, to kind of unlearn something and relearn like the real stuff. So try and stick with me today. It's not that difficult, but it is different. And it's very difficult to convince yourself it's worth changing. Um, okay, so ratios, I'm going to just give you a, a problem to do, write a ratio, just to make sure we're all on the same page here. So, um, 3.5 today, 3.6, 3.5 right now, number 46.
and we're gonna we're gonna stay with fractions. Fractions are the the, uh, the form of ratios that we use pretty much all the time. We can say 16 to 30. That's one way to say a ratio. We can do 16 colon 30. That's another way to say a ratio. But when we want to include it in like a math equation or whatever, we're gonna use a fraction. That's just the way that. Uh, to look at ratios if we're going to use them in an equation from scratch. Okay, is this the ratio of the number of girls to boys? Yeah. What is it? It's boys to everyone. Boys to everyone. How about this one? Girls to everyone. Girls to everyone. Okay, and, and some of you had just this and, and that and both of those written down. But it just wants one ratio. The ratio of girls to boys. Yeah. There's 14 girls. 16 boys, 14 to 16 would be the ratio of boys to girls, or girls to boys. And that order is important when we say girls to boys, that means 14 to 16, 14 over 16, and if we said boys to girls, we'd mean 16 over 14. Okay. So that's just the basics. We're just starting out writing ratios, understanding the language when we say this to that, comparing this number to that number. We're going to try to convey a fraction. Um, now, let's uh, so go over so a few more examples of ratios. Like um, over here, we have different kinds of calculators. When all of them are turned in, nobody's borrowing them. There's nine of these, nine scientific calculators, and there's 11 of these, 11 graphing calculators. So the ratio is 9 to 11, or 11 to 9 if we look at it the other way. For every nine of these, there's 11 of these. Um, we can look at uh, my algebra one books versus my algebra two books that I have out to loan to people. I just got one back for my algebra two. So I have six algebra one books to 21 algebra two books. Okay. Um, in this, it, well, in the education setting, there's a a really common ratio that we talk about is the teacher to student ratio, right? Can't be too low, right? If the ratio of teacher to student is low, what does that mean? Need more teachers. It's what? Need more teachers. Need more teachers. We have too many students to teachers, right? We can look at it the other way. The student to teacher ratio, we don't want that to be too high. student so there's lots of students the bigger the number of students the smaller this number is because we're dividing this by a big number if we do student to teacher we would say we don't want this to get too high because the bigger this student number is the bigger this fraction is if the, if the teacher number stays the same so in here we have a one to ratio today of teachers to students. The ratio of students to teachers is 27 to 1. Okay, that's a lot of work for me. So you're aware. All right. Um, but what we want to do, we, we don't want to just write ratios all day long. That doesn't really do anything for us. We want to be able to say, well, here's a ratio I observed. And uh, I'm going to assume that that ratio is going to stay consistent in another situation and see Um, so let's say we have this recipe for uh, banana pudding. Gosh, pudding. Banana. 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 Yeah, that's right. Uh, so for a recipe for banana pudding, uh, it calls for four bananas. Meaning that 
six people could eat the pudding that's made with four bananas. Okay. But we don't uh, want just six servings, we want more. We have more friends coming over. So we want to have 21 servings. So how many bananas? Four, 21 servings. Gonna, it doesn't take a whole lot to figure it out. Sure. structuring it in a, in a similar way each time we approach a problem like this. It's called inductive reasoning. We can say, oh, this is a, a problem where I have one ratio, and I have another ratio, but one part of it is unknown, and I solve for that unknown part of the ratio. And we can set that up. We can set the two ratios equal to each other, and that's called a proportion. Two ratios equal to each other is called a proportion. Well, this sets up quite a few different ways. So, what ratios could we set equal to each other? As this to that. It must be the same as this to that. Yes? Uh, four, six, and four There's four bananas to six servings. If we want the, the consistency of the bananas, the, the, the concentration of bananas to stay the same, then we'd have to have the same the, the same concentration same ratio of bananas to servings. So however many bananas there are, it's got to be the same ratio of bananas to servings here as it will be here. So now it's a matter of how do we solve the table? And then 21 divided by 6, we got 3.5, and then times 4 by 3.5, got 5. Why did you do that? What? Why did you Times three point five is twenty one. <laughs> okay. That's that's something. And then you do four times three point five and I got fourteen. So I did four for six servings, fourteen bananas, twenty one servings. Okay. Why did you do all this? How, how did you know? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It just did. Okay, okay. that's like, like largely a huge common response to I don't know, I just did it. And that that works fine if, if, if your job for the rest of your life is only solving equations like this, then you got it made. But if I want to make the equations more complicated, we've got to have building blocks. We've got to get there from here. Right? So which means we have to have like this consistent system, this algebraic system. So if you can explain it, you say, well, I set this equal to that, and because it's an equation, I, I know I can do these things. That's what we want. We want to have that structure. Can you use four times twenty-one and divide by six to find the value of x? Um, maybe you could. Can you justify it? Start with pop. Is that start with pop? Okay. We're trying to break down it the rules. Of it works. That's how I was taught. I got the right answer. All right. That's this. This is a really simple equation. So, okay, I said, I told you, you could find it. You can figure it out. But I'm asking you, could you explain it to somebody in a way that is talking about the equation? It's not talking about just do this. Just do this and you'll get the answer. Right? This is an easy answer to find. So I'm not really interested if you can find it. I'm interested in how you're finding it and why that works. So that we can then make the equation's more complicated. It's kind of how it works. We introduce like a kind of a simple idea, we scale it up, make it more difficult. But if we start out with the building block of, hey, this is an equation. We can do the same thing to both sides of an equation. Here's a thing we can do that will get x by itself. That's where you want to come from. Yes? Does anybody have any
the idea how to get x by itself. We just want to leave x on one side by itself, and whatever does that, that's what we want to do. Okay, so that's a thing that we can we can do. It's arithmetic. Let's say twenty one over one. Well, that's what's that going to do over here? We get twenty one divided by twenty one. One one times x. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. So if we like already, if since you already like, well, most of us, I'm uh -huh. guessing, already know how to do a lot of this. Uh -huh. Why do you want us to start like have it like we don't know how to do it? Um, because. So let's say you know how to do that. Mm -hmm. Probably a lot of you have done cross multiplication and you do that, okay? Um, if, if you know about cross multiplication, uh, then we change the problem a little bit. And if a plus three, okay, well now that's not gonna work. The cross multiplication is not going to work in this situation. What do you do? get you away from a place where I need to be told exactly what I'm supposed to do in every situation to be able to adapt to a new situation. Well, this is, you, you could, if you wanted to work with this and, and turn it into a problem, you could use cross multiplication on it. The thing about cross multiplication is if you can't explain why it works, uh, but it's possible to explain why it works, you should come to the place where you can explain why it works. And cross multiplication, it's true and it works. If you have one equation equal to another, then you can cross multiply. One place the denominator times this numerator equals this numerator times this denominator. It's true, but you don't know why, okay? Which is basically just waving a magic wand if you don't know what's going on. And when the equation becomes more complicated, then it's going to be much easier to, to learn how to solve an equation like this if you have the building blocks from before, understanding what makes uh, a simpler equation work or how, it, how it's solvable or what makes cross multiplication possible. You know, we cannot, it's impossible unless you have a very large, very moldable brain that picks up things very quickly to just memorize all the stuff that you're supposed to do. You can't memorize all the formulas, you can't memorize all of like, this is this kind of thing, so I solve it this way with these, I just move these numbers around like this, because I've been told that way. Um, I know it's a difficult sell. I'm trying to be a salesman right now and, and get you to, to buy what I'm selling, that you should learn what I'm trying to teach you. Um, if you want to just keep doing cross multiplication and not listen, not really pay attention to what I'm going to say today, okay, but then when I put plus three, the cross multiplication group is going to find it more difficult to understand how to solve this problem. And then when we, I don't know, add 2x or something like that, now it becomes even a farther reach because I'm in cross multiplication. Bring it back to cross multiplication for me. And at some point, that just becomes harder than understanding the, the basics. Um, and another reason is because it's just from my experience, trying to, to teach students um, something fairly complicated uh, that, that could be a lot easier if they had along the way learned all these building blocks, had a, a solid foundation of, I understand the math, I understand the math, I understand the math. Okay. And get you from a, a place of, I understand a lot of the stuff that goes on behind the scenes here, I just don't quite understand how to make this little leap. If you're way back here, at, I only know that I can do cross multiplication and I don't know why it works. And I try to take you all the way over here, it's a huge leap. Okay. At some point you've got to have an understanding, so now is the time, take advantage of it. Okay, so back to here. We're multiplying by 21 on both sides. Um, so 
21 divided by 21, that's all this is. That's one, one times x is just x. Now over here, um, have six has a factor of two in it. Three, two. Uh, 21 has a factor of three in it, so this becomes seven. Seven times two is 14. by 21 on both sides and cancel out what we can over there on the left side and it comes out as it comes out 14. So let's let's like just run through that again. Okay, x over 21 equals uh, six seven, four to six. Number one goal of algebra is get that variable by itself. Cancel out all that other stuff and get just one x plus nothing else. That's what we want. Okay. Um, so right now we have x divided by 21. Now this is an equation that we're not unfamiliar with. We've had x divided by a number before, haven't we? We have. Probably it was maybe equal to just a number, like 7 or 5 or whatever. So that wasn't that bad. But now it's equal to a fraction, so it's a little bit one more uh, layer of complexity, but it's not that bad. It's just a fraction. So if we want to eliminate this 21, if we multiply by 21, what that really is is we multiply straight across, right? So we get 20x, 21x over 21. 21 over 21 times x. 21 divided by 21 is 1. So x is left by itself. Okay. Now you don't have to write all those steps every time, but you should be able to. You should be able to justify why those things cancel out. Now over here, we have to multiply by 21 as well. Uh, we could just multiply straight across. 21 times 4 is, well, what is it, 84 over 6. And divide 84 by 6, pretty sure we're going to get 14. And if you can get on board with me here, right now, about the idea of multiplying on both sides by 21, cancel out the denominator, when I put variables in the denominator, it'll make that discussion a lot easier as well. Toby? So how exactly did the 21, I mean the 6 go, does it, does it always work that the denominator on the first one, so 6 will go up to 6, 4, and then go across to 6, 21, too? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I understand the Because you did 6, okay, so, so you turn 6 into 3 and 4 into 2, and then you turn, you use the 3 to turn 21 into 7. Oh, and the other example? Yeah. Or the other way that I worked it out? Well, yeah, these are going to get multiplied together, right? So there's going to be big, one big number. There would be 84 so, I mean, on this side. Will it always work that way where you take the 3 up and across? Up and across. Yeah. Because the 21 to make it 7. You mean to cancel the 3 with the 21? Yes. It. It can work if they have a common factor. Like if 21 is divisible by 3, then yeah, it works. If 21 wasn't divisible by, say, 5, if this were, were a 5, then no, it wouldn't. So, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. It won't always work that this will cancel with this thing, because if they don't share any factors, it, it won't work. That only happened because we set up the problem with some nice numbers so that it came out. The main idea here is, if we want to get rid of this denominator of 21, let's multiply by 21. Because 21 divided by 21 is 1, and that would just leave x by itself. If you want to get rid of that denominator, multiply this fraction by that denominator. Whenever that happens, this, in this numerator, this denominator, uh, the denominator is dividing the numerator, they're identical, so we get 1. So we get cancellation. Um, So 3.5 over 51. So I want you to do number 51. 51 is a short word problem. Mm -hmm. 51 right there. Very similar to 
and a banana serving problem. The first four games of the season, the soccer team scored a total of 10 goals. If this trend continues, how many goals will the team score in 18 remaining, uh, 18 remaining games of the season? So we have x, right? We're going to know what x is. x is the number of goals they're going to score. Right? And the ratio of goals to games, which for the remaining, the remaining part of the season is 18 games, if this says, in that problem, it's important that it says, if this trend continues, which means that they'll score the same ratios of goals, uh, total number of goals in, in, the, in 18 games as they did when they scored four goals, or sorry, 10 goals. What did it say? For four games? 10 goals for four games. The ratio should be equivalent. Right? And yes, we, we can just do cross multiplication, or we can do any number of things. I've seen several little tricks that people have been taught over, you know, having different teachers and different states. Um, lots of different things to do to solve for x. But what we want to do now is take it to a place where we're in control. We don't need to be told what to do. We don't need somebody to come along and show us a process. We understand that doing certain things interact in certain ways, and if we get them to interact in the right way, we can eliminate some of those numbers and isolate the number that we want to isolate. So we want to isolate x. We want to get rid of 18. How can we, just using mathematical operations, counteract that 18? Multiply it by 18 over 1, if you like to look at it. 18 divided by 18 is just 1, leaving x by itself. Multiply by 18 over 1 here. Um, let's see. 4 and 18 share a factor of 2. This will be 9 and 2. 10 divided by 2 is 5. 9 mm -hmm. times 5 is 45. Um, I want you to imagine you're teaching somebody this thing, whatever it is. It's so broad that I don't know that I can pick a specific scenario. Um, maybe, maybe we all play some kind of a sport. What's the sport that you think most people in here have played? Basketball. Basketball, most people have played basketball. Mm. Yeah, I can tell you. How many of you have played basketball? I played check Quite a few basketball players. Okay, so and and let's let's maybe ask those basketball players. All right, if uh, if I come to you and I say I actually did it with a friend of mine who played basketball in high school, I said, could you just could you teach me how to play basketball? Because I feel some people start playing, I feel really embarrassed that I have no skills whatsoever in basketball. We can do other things. I can play ultimate frisbee and and. Uh, But let's talk about basketball. So if I came to you and I said, teach me about basketball, and um, you want to teach me the proper way to shoot the ball, OK? And uh, so what is there a proper form to shooting the basketball? No. Yes. yes. Oh. <laughs> What's the proper form look like? So you're, I actually, he taught, this is one of the things he taught me. So you know, push it up, right? Kind of straight up, and then you flick the wrist to give it the forward motion, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So now, say I come mm -hmm. to you. I come to you, the person who knows about basketball. You're telling me, look, 
and he explained it to me this way. You do this, it, it gives you the best control over the ball, the most consistent shot, right? You want to improve the probability that you're going to make this shot. So you want to push it straight up like that and, and flick the wrist and, and the wrist give it that forward motion, okay? Um, and for one thing, the, the higher you, you push it, the more arc it has on it, the more, the higher probability it has of going in the basket. So it's like holding the basket for a longer period of time, mm -hmm. right? Maybe that doesn't make the most sense. That's not the more, most important thing. But there's these reasons why you shoot the basketball that way, okay? Then I say to you, forget that, right? Because I practiced over the weekend, and uh, or I, or I watched this YouTube video or, or something, and I've been shooting it like this, right? <laughs> Throwing it under like that. And uh, you know, inside the key, I do just fine. I, I make 75% you know, of my shots. Alright? What are you gonna say to me? Good for you. Good for you. It's not okay. Why should I shoot it the way you're saying? It's more accurate. It's more accurate. People can feel it. So you're saying that I'll make it more often if I shoot it the proper way, okay? But it's working for me now. When I was practicing you know, by myself in the gym, I was making it like a good amount of time. But in the actual game, if you have your ball, the ball down here, uh -huh. who's gonna feel it? I mean, if you have the ball closer to you, uh -huh. is it more? Okay, so there's a reason. If I'm shooting from down here. I don't shoot like that. <laughs> So if I'm shooting from down here, for when somebody could steal it, it's way easier to block it, right? If, I'm, if someone's standing right in front of me, I'm trying to shoot it, I'm just gonna just throw it into their body. It's not gonna be very helpful, right? There's all these reasons why this has been researched to be the best way to shoot the basketball, right? Just like this. Push it up and you get it over the person's head. I don't know, Brett, did you have something else too? No. Oh, I thought you raised your hand. Uh, there's, there's all these reasons, right? And you know them. You've been playing basketball for longer than I have, which I've been playing never. Maybe played a few games of basketball in my life. Okay, so I should probably listen to you and just trust that if I practice the way you're saying, it's gonna make it more often. I'm gonna get blocked less often. It's gonna be more consistent. Not only does just switching to that make it more likely that I'll do it, by having that consistency, I will start to get better at making it, okay? And let's say, not 75%, but maybe shooting like this, I was making it half the time. I don't know, I don't know if that's good or not. Um, but if I change to your way, it's going to be more often, more than half the time, right? And if I keep shooting it like this, it's just lots of roadblocks. It's just gonna cause me problems. And if I keep learning it this way, keep doing it this way, it's just gonna get more difficult. And I just won't be able to improve as a basketball player. Okay? Uh, there's an element of that here. I'm asking you, as, a, as the expert basketball player, to trust that there are levels of difficulty down the road that you can't see, you don't know. Um, just like you would ask me to shoot the basketball correctly, I'm, I'm saying it's, it's gonna get more difficult. And if you keep shooting it like this, if you keep just relying on memorization and such, uh, of, of tricks that you've been taught, well, it's just gonna be a whole lot harder to make that starting lineup when you start playing more talented teams like that, okay? I'm trying to use an analogy to help you to see that though it might be more difficult, I know it might be annoying, you might be annoyed just listening to me talk right now about this. If, if I haven't convinced you from a mathematical standpoint, Maybe you can just trust that I know what I'm talking about. Okay. Let's try, um, it won't be a word problem, but it'll just be a, a portion that's set up for us already. Um, together, we'll take a look at 38. say is that we want W to be isolated. We want it to be by itself. So it's 
whether you're doing one step or two steps or three steps, however many steps it takes, what ideas do you have to get it by itself or closer to being by itself? by 4 over 56. Yeah. Okay? Let's multiply by 4 over 56 on both sides. Okay. Well, that, we won't worry about that side. We want to see, did it do anything for us on this side? That's, that's the most important. Well, how do we multiply fractions? Very good. Dividing. Dividing is the reciprocal. Oh, if we're multiplying, how do we multiply? Straight across. Straight across. Um, What's 4w times 4? 16, W. That's 56 times 56. That's a big one. You just said it. How long did you do this before? Well, did it? Isn't it an advantage to us on this side? No. Okay. Well, then we'll let's not worry about the other side then. Let's just go back. Alright. But I think I think a good solution is not far off from that. Can we kind of tweak that a little bit? You can take four over four four over fifty-six times fifty-six over four. So instead of multiplying by four over fifty-six, multiply by fifty-six over four. Let's see if it helps us out over here. Uh, what's 4 times 56? 224. 224 times W over, also 224. Well, does 224 cancel this 224? Yeah. Why? Because they're the same number. Yeah. They are the same number. What's that? Two twenty four divided by two twenty four is one. Right? And so that's one times W, that's W. But we should definitely do that on the other side because we've got a W by itself on this side. So that'll that help us out over here. Uh, four times for twelve, that'll be three times one. Fifty six and twelve, forty two share a factor of uh, twenty two at least. Twenty one times one over one times one is just four. W is four. If all that crossing out and writing new numbers is, is like too confusing, then just multiply those two fractions together and simplify you know one step at a time from there. So we multiply by the reciprocal of, of this fraction. Again, we'll do it more in a classical cross multiplication way. Cross multiplication would say multiply your numerator times your denominator, your numerator times your denominator, so 12 times 56. I don't know what to do. But 12 times 56. 672. Forty 
two times four. Now, why can you do that? If you, can, if you can tell me why, then go for it. But if you, if you don't know why, if you don't know what's really going on, then it's just a magic trick. Okay, well, if we're going to use cross multiplication, then let's look at how we can justify it. How we can kind of prove that it's true. Well, you're multiplying 12 by 56, right? Aren't you? Okay, well, we're multiplying 12 by 56, which means we should really be multiplying both sides by 56, because that's what actually is happening. So on this side, when you multiply this side by 56, what happens? And here we multiply 4w times 42. Well, the 56 is canceled. Multiply this by 42. We should really be multiplying both sides by 42. On this side, when you multiply by 42, what happens? Multiplying straight across here, right? So it wouldn't be any different than to write 42 over 42 times 56 over 1 times 12 over 1. <laughs> that would make the same thing. This is still, still these three numbers multiplied in the numerator, and 42 times 1 times 1 in the denominator. 42 divided by 42 is 1. So on this side we get 56 times 12 equals 4w times 42. Same as cross multiplication, but without any mystery involved. multiplication in this problem and lots of other kinds of problems and the, the problems with before. Um, it, it takes extra steps actually to use cross multiplication. If you just think all I want is to get m by itself, which means I don't want this 8 and I don't want this 3, so let me figure out how I can get rid of both of those things so m is by itself. That's what I want you to work on. Give that a thought for a, a minute or so.
Multiply this by this. Yeah. You multiply it by this. Eight m plus four. Um. Okay. Eight yeah. m yeah. plus twenty four over twenty four. Mm -hmm. Then what? Uh, twenty four cancels out. How do you? How can you justify that? Because they're the same number, and you can just draw a line through the two of them. Yeah, they're the same number. <laughs> they are the same number. Okay, but it's twenty four dividing. Just 24? No. It's also dividing 8m. Yeah. <laughs> so, if we want the 24 to cancel the 24, yeah. we'd have to look at it this way. 8m over 24 plus 24 over 24. And now, 24 divided by 4, 24 divided by 24 is 1. Mm -hmm. And over here, we have 8m over 24. Okay. So if we're going to do that, we just have to realize that's happening. This 3 does not, in effect, cancel this three. When we cancel things out, we're canceling common factors, okay? So we, we talked about this quite a while ago, at the beginning of the year. What is a factor? What does it mean if something is a factor? We got 15. Is three a factor of 15? How can you be sure? What's the proof of that? Three times five. Three times five is 15. That's why three is a factor. Also, for the same reason, five is a factor. Okay? So if we had 15 over three, we can cancel the three with the 15 because what we're really doing is saying this. Three divided by three times five over one. So three divided by three is one. So over here, that's not the case. We can't write it that way. Because it's a, a sum in the numerator, they, they don't combine that way. If, we, if we're adding these two together, that means we, we must have added two fractions with a common denominator of 24. But as long as we respect all the, the math, um, and yet, let's see, 64, that's what that's uh, 8 and 40 is 5. So now we have 5 thirds over here. And the 24 is canceled, so now we have a 5 thirds. 
Now I have 8m over 24 plus 1 equals 5 thirds. saying we could do this a little more easily without um, just jumping across multiplication. What are we going to do? Yeah, if you started at the beginning instead of um, multiplying from 8 thirds, you could just multiply by 8 on each side. Okay. And it would get rid of that 8 and... Okay, so these two yeah. together, because you could write it as 8 over 8 times m plus 3 over 1, and 8 divided by 8 is 1, and you're just left with m plus 3. And then you can simplify 64 and 8, and, um, and then you're left with showing you is that the idea was that 3 would cancel with 3. The thing that we need to realize is that, well, that doesn't work. This 3 does not cancel this 3. This 3 is not a factor of the numerator. Um, and coming back to, to this guy right here, this 20, for the same reason 24 does not cancel this 24. This is really the sum of two fractions with the same denominator. 8m would have to have a denominator of 24, and this just would turn into plus 1, which becomes uh, more difficult than we thought it would be. But Hunter showed us a great way. If we multiply by 8, right, we can justify that that cancels out the 8, so that leaves just m plus 3, and over here that leaves 5, and then we just subtract 3 on both sides. So something we should be noticing here is that we have x over a 5 equals, it doesn't really matter. If we want to get at x, but x has a denominator of 5, how do we cancel out the denominator? Times by 5. Okay. Um, it might be helpful just to get rid of the denominator first. right? If, if we don't want to make any mistakes, just get rid of the denominator first by multiplying by the denominator. Multiply by 5. Cancel up the denominator first, get rid of that. Look at the numerator now, right? It's been left by itself. See what we can do to isolate the, the variable from that numerator. Just like Hunter showed it in this problem.
So again, we have this denominator of 8. And we don't want this denominator of 8. How do we get rid of this denominator of 8? Times 8. Times 8. Times 8. OK. And uh, 8 and 1 12 share factors of 4. Two share factors of two, right? It's 56 divided by two. Common denominator, one half plus six halves, seven halves. C is seven halves. to add one half to the thing. And if this is 3 over 1, multiply this by 2, multiply this by 